All right, we come now to Daniel chapter 7. And uh, the, let me warn you, the kid in me is, uh, I don't know, kind of sad to leave chapters 1 through 6. The exciting stories of chapters 1 through 6. In fact, I was telling uh, one of the other men I work with um, today that oh, I, I, part of me feels disappointed going into uh, uh, chapter 7 through 12. And of course, I feel guilty because it's scripture and it's very, very informative scripture. But then I didn't feel so bad um, because Daniel kind of felt like I did with some of this stuff. Um, and the end of chapter 7, verse 28, he said, Hitherto is the end of uh, the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cognitions, my, tru- my, my thoughts, uh, much troubled me. And so I thought, there you go, Daniel, me, me and you both, maybe for different reasons, <laughs> but, uh, but you and me both. But truly, as we enter chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, we're coming now to a more prophetic uh, portion of Daniel. And by no means uh, unimportant, be- just because uh, it's not, as a child, the more exciting things that you'll find in Daniel, they're still very, very exciting things. And in fact, the more I age, the more excited I can be as I can uh, understand and stitch uh, thoughts together from Scripture. So we come now to these. uh, The first six chapters of Daniel have been historical in nature. It deals with Daniel and his personal friends. The next six will deal with Daniel and his people's future. It is prophetic in nature. Chronology is left and visions begin, though uh, these are still chronological. Um, Chapter 7 is the vision number 1. And it's found in the first year of Belshazzar. Chapter 8 is vision 2 in the third year of Belshazzar. Chapter 9 is vision 3 in the first year of Darius. And then chapters 10, 11, and 12 are the fourth vision in the third year of Cyrus. Uh, So the second half of this book, with the exception of uh, chapter 7, verse 1, and Chapter 10, verse 1, is in the first person, while the first half was in the third person. Chapters 7 and 8 will deal with two coming dictators. Chapters 9 and 10 will deal with two critical delays. Chapters 11 through 12 will deal with two complete uh, disclosures. So, Daniel and his people's future, uh, section 2 of this book. So, part 1, we see... uh, Chapter 7, verse 1 through 8, 27. And for this period, we'll just try to uh, cover chapter 7. But two coming dictators. Each of these men are described as a little horn, though they are not the same person. The little horn in chapter 7 is the Antichrist. And the little horn in chapter 8 is Antiochus. At the time, the information about Antiochus was prophetic, but today it is historical. So it's fun to study him from both sides, both looking forward to his day and looking back from ours. The Antichrist, though, is not yet on the scene, so we are confined to prophecy for our information about him. Antiochus is associated with the final stages of the Greek Empire, and Antichrist is associated with the final stages of the Roman Empire. So we come now to uh, chapter 7, the coming of Antichrist, chapter 7, verses 1 through 28. Just a quick reminder, interesting, uh, in this book we are still using the Aramaic, or the Syriac, uh, though to the end of this chapter. uh, And then in chapter 8, Hebrew will pick back up as the language, the original language. Chapter 7, the chapter here, parallels chapter 2 in many ways. The four successive beasts and the four successive world kingdoms and the Son of Man uh, with the fifth kingdom. So, uh, the introduction to the vision, verses 1 through 3. 
Apparently, he spoke uh, and recorded as he actively beheld the dream with its visions, since he used the active participle, I was continually looking. Kind of see that in verses uh, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 11. So first of all, underneath uh, this introduction to the vision, we see first of all, when Daniel dreamed. Uh, we'll look at verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. So uh, this would have been in the first year that Belshazzar co-reigned with his father Nabonidus. Now they apparently co-reigned from 556 to 539 BC with uh, uh, Nabonidus ruling from Arabia and Babylon, uh, Belshazzar from Babylon. Tradition does, however, suggest that Belshazzar began his co-reign in 553 BC. So he was seeing what would occur in the future, starting just 17 years away in 539 BC. The time of the dream would have been between chapters 4 and 5, between the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar and the overthrow of Belshazzar. <laughs> no wonder Daniel was less than enthusiastic about the gifts offered to him by Belshazzar, having had this dream and knowing full well what was going to happen. Belshazzar was the eldest son of Nabonidus and heir to the throne of Babylon. His father became emperor about the, about the age of 20 by murdering the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, Labashi Marduk. He reigned for 17 years but cared little for the kingdom for the last 10. During this time, Nabonidus lived in virtual retirement at Tima, and Belshazzar ran things from Babylon. The glory of Babylon was fading quickly due to immorality. Belshazzar himself was a profligate. Weakness as well. Um, Nabonidus was not interested in strengthening Babylon. And division from within also weakened. Nabonidus had alienated the priesthood. And then, of course, forces were strengthening from without. In the Persian Empire, Daniel will once again be thrust center stage, but for now he was probably living in retirement to some degree, probably spending his time resting, studying, meditating, and praying. So we, uh, we see when Daniel dreamed. Then we see what Daniel dreamed, verses 2 and 3. Um, this must have caused him to think back to Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, about the image with four parts. Uh, so Daniel dreamed uh, some similar uh, uh, themes, and he probably thought back to Nebuchadnezzar's. Uh, his dream had much in common. The course of the Gentile world down through the ages, the difference lies mostly in perspective. Nebuchadnezzar saw that passing Gentile kingdoms of the world as a glorious image, well-proportioned, intelligent, godlike, and splendid, one to be put up on a pedestal and worshipped, as he did later. The substance, strength, and scenarios were varied, but the symbol was one complete whole. Daniel, however, saw the same kingdom as something bestial and dreadful as God saw them. So from Nebuchadnezzar's mindset, he saw the kingdoms as magnificent. And then from God's perspective, these kingdoms were uh, uh, dreadful and uh, beast, uh, bestial. Um, so a matter of perspective, uh, seeing the same thing. So uh, what Daniel dreamed, verses 2 and 3, uh, let's go ahead and read those, and I'll give you a couple sub-points underneath. Uh, Daniel spake and, I said, and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So I'd like to point out underneath what Daniel dreamed. First of all, the striving winds. The striving winds from verse 2. Striving uh, here literally kind of has the idea of bursting forth. Apparently this picture strife, 
upon the sea of humanity. Uh, Isaiah says something similar. Uh, Isaiah 17, verses 12 and, and 13, as well as chapter 57, verse 20. Uh, it says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt. So you think of a, a troubled sea, not clear, but, but full of mud from, from stirring up the mire from beneath. So we see the striving winds, first of all. The geographical location for Nebuchadnezzar's dream was Babylon. World powers were those who were able to hold Babylon. In this vision, the location is the Great Sea. Um, that sounds like the Mediterranean. For God, the area of Israel, and especially Jerusalem, was central, but not Babylon. Thus begins the time of the Gentiles, spoken of in Luke 21-24 which will last through the reign of Antichrist and on into the Lord's return and the establishment of his kingdom. The four winds uh, might symbolize even those four great angel princes that we saw in Revelation 7, 1 through 3 and 9, verses 14 and 15, uh, those that held uh, the great winds in Revelation 1 through 3. Um, it seems like we could be talking about the, the, what, what Paul talked about in Ephesians chapter 6, the powers of the air that we are striving against in our prayers. Uh, these are subject to Satan, Ephesians 2.2. 2, and through them he holds the power on this earth. Each in turn was able to parade its own wild beast kingdom as his prize exhibit. So um, these would rule over nations that were to seize world power. And so we see the, the striving. But then we see, secondly, underneath this, the stormy waves. The stormy waves. Uh, the four beasts rose successively out of the sea of nations. Um, you can cross-reference uh, Revelation 13.1. Uh, they were great and diverse. You can cross-reference uh, Ezekiel uh, 29, verse 2, even in there. Uh, the, even the dreadfulness of, of, of world powers. All the world powers eventually, if not initially, held territory on the Mediterranean, moving, over, moving ever westward until the time of the Roman Empire, when the Mediterranean was basically a Roman lake. Um, God's boundaries for the promised land uh, were the Euphrates on the east and the Mediterranean on the west, Numbers 34, 6 through 7, and Joshua 1, 4. Babylon was five or six hundred miles away, but its conquests had brought it here. Even Persia, which was much farther away, would come to fight with Greece. By the time Rome came to power, Palestine was the geographic center of the prophetic earth. This prophetic earth reached as far north as Armenia, as far south as Ethiopia, as far west as Tarshish, and as far east as Chinai, uh, Sinin, Isaiah 49, 12. Uh, lands beyond these boundaries are largely ignored in Scripture. It seems that Russia will one day invade Israel, Ezekiel 38 and 39, but will be swept away, leaving a vacuum for the Antichrist to fill. So the Mediterranean was, was kind of a Roman lake, um, as, as great as it was, the great empire of Rome was uh, just, just that large. The wild beasts correspond to the four metals in the image of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now Daniel was a teenager back then when he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but here he's elderly. The time of the, ki of the captivity is drawing to a close. Most wouldn't even bother returning to the promised land. They had grown so comfortable in Babylon. Now it was time to look to the future. Daniel had been poring over the scriptures, and God was now going to show more of what the future held. All right, so we saw the, uh, the introduction uh, of the vision. Now we see the, uh, the information of the vision, verses uh, uh, 4 through 14, the information of the vision. Uh, so first of all, underneath this, the similar empires he saw, verses 4 through 6. Um, so let's read verse 4, and we'll look at the supremacy of the Babylonian Empire, 
Verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the, the wings were, thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So the supremacy of the Babylonian Empire. Remember that each of these nations is striving upon the sea, and each in turn rides to power upon the tidal war, uh, the tidal wave of war, so to speak. Uh, two things underneath this, conquest and conversion. At the beginning, we see conquest. Daniel used the preposition calf in his uh, passage, showing that he is using a simile uh, for like or as. He is likening the first beast um, to uh, a lion with eagle's wings. This, according to literary propriety, must be referring to Babylon. Of course, Babylon was founded by Nimrod, uh, one of our Old Testament types for the Antichrist, who also founded the Assyrian Empire. It was the fountainhead of idolatry, astronomy, and astrology. It was located where the Euphrates ceased to be a vast expanse and narrowed to a navigable river. Um, it was surely the Vanity Fair of Daniel's day. So uh, it was referring to Babylon more specifically, Nebuchadnezzar. Jeremiah already identified Babylon with the lion in Jeremiah 4.7 and with the eagle in Jeremiah 49.22. Nebuchadnezzar saw this kingdom as gold. Daniel saw it as a lion, both depicting supremacy uh, and, and sovereignty. These also speak of swiftness and power. Nebuchadnezzar was able to swiftly conquer Syria, Palestine, uh, besiege and take Tyre, and defeat Egypt. We also see a conversion in this passage, and, and we remember uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar when he uh, had the mind of a beast and was restored, and uh, I believe found the Lord as a Savior. Um, so the wings were plucked uh, in this verse as well. The, sim the, the symbolism seems to coincide with Nebuchadnezzar having lost his sanity and then regaining it. It could also refer to war having uh, lost its charm and point to a more peaceful time in Nebuchadnezzar's reign or of Belshazzar who liked to have parties uh, under the illusion that Babylon was impregnable. Well, he was made to stand like a man. Uh, fierce lion is made to become mortal man in here. So then, so we saw the supremacy of the Babylonian Empire. Now we see the savagery of the Persian Empire. Uh, verse 5. And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, be, uh, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. So this harkens back to the breast and arms uh, of silver, in the image. Um, there are two arms, probably uh, the, the Medo-Persia, the Medes and the Persians. So two things about this, we see that it was ponderous, uh, well three things, ponderous, powerful, and persistent. Ponderous, powerful, and persistent. First of all, ponderous, um, uh, raised on one side, slow, uh, steady onslaught, of all who stood before it, achieves objectives with sheer strength and brute force. We see uh, that it was powerful, this beast. Uh, there were three ribs, um, possibly depicting three major victories that established her as a world power. In 539, there was a victory over Babylon, 546 over Lydia, and 525 over Egypt. It did not move except with overwhelming force. It was wasteful of human life. When Darius marched through uh, Scythia, for example, he mobilized nearly three quarters of a million men, not counting his fleet of 600 ships. When Xerxes marched against Greece, he took two and a half million troops with him. The movement of the mass of men looked more like a migration than the movement of an army. 
even Persia's last and, mo and, and most pacific or peaceful king brought more than half a million men to the battle of Isis with two years, or I'm sorry, and two years after their defeat was able to find another million men uh, for his final battle. So it was ponderous and powerful and persistent. Uh, they, uh, here, must be referring to heavenly speakers urging the beast to conquer many nations according to God's sovereign, sovereign plan. The devouring of much flesh may even refer to the way they built their armies. They would swell their ranks with hordes of humanity from all their conquered places. Herodotus described no less than 56 nationalities conscripted by Xerxes for his march against Greece. There were also camp followers of all kinds. What a mess. <laughs> okay, then, then thirdly, underneath uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the similar empires that he saw, uh, in verse 6 we see the swiftness of the Grecian Empire. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So we see a beast here, like a leopard, with four wings and four heads. Uh, this is Greece. Um, the belly and thighs of brass from the image. So a couple things, how it would come, and then how it would continue. Uh, how it would come... Uh, there would be conquests of great speed. Uh, about 334 to 324 BC under Alexander the Great. And then how it would continue. Uh, four heads probably referred to the four generals who took over when Alexander died. They were Antipater, who took Greece and Macedonia. Uh, uh, Lysimachus, uh, who took Thrace and Asia Minor. Seleucus the first. Uh, Nicator, who took Syria, Babylon, and Middle East, and Ptolemy I Soter, who took Egypt and Palestine. So uh, we saw the, um, the similar empires he saw. Then secondly, verses 7 and 8, we see the subsequent empire that he saw. Verses 7 and 8. The beast was so terrible, uh, this one that he saw in verses 7 and 8, that it was unlike anything on this planet. It was dreadful, terrible, exceeding strong, and diverse. So he doesn't compare it to anything. It was just unlike anything. Isn't any wonder later on, all these things he's seeing in verse 28, later on he says, my cognitions troubled me and my countenance was changed. He's seeing all these dreadful things. So we see uh, uh, the horror of the Roman Empire. Um, and then we see the horns of the Roman Empire. So the horror of the Roman Empire we see in uh, uh, verse 7. So let's read verse, verse 7. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and had ten horns. So the horror of this Roman Empire, we see two things, its might and its method. Its might, uh, we see iron teeth, uh, which correspond to the ten toes of the image from chapter 2, um, and the ten horns. Um, uh, in Psalm 132, verse 17, there's a different horn, a horn of David, budding in Jerusalem. And this is the good horn <laughs> that we ought to be associated with. But here's, the, here's, a, here's a horn in, uh, in Rome. So the devil has his horns, God has his horns, and we want to make sure we're associated with the right horn. But it had tremendous, terrible, dreadful might. But then we see its method in the end of verse 7, it devoured break and stamped all in its path. This empire was known for its uh, brutal cruelty and irresistible power. The three PL uh, verbs are active, indicating a continuous action of stamping 
etc. So the horror of the Roman Empire, then we see the, the horns of the Roman Empire. Uh, it had ten horns in verse 8. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up from among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So uh, this empire was the iron legs and clay feet of Nebuchadnezzar's image back in chapter 2, verse 33. So he saw ten horns, uh, and we'll see more about that later on. And then he saw a tiny horn. Uh, so Daniel is looking very intensely at the horns. Uh, three things about this horn. We see uh, this tiny horn. We see its coming, its conquests, and its character. It's coming, we see, first of all, another little horn appeared. He is a world leader of the future. His description fits that of Antichrist, who was the son of perdition and man of sin that we read about in 2 Thessalonians 2. From the following passages, 1 John 2, 4, uh, 2 John 1, Revelation 6, for, uh, Revelation 6, uh, as well as 11 through 13 and 19, Daniel 7 and 9, uh, Zechariah 14, and 1 Thessalonians 4, we learn that he will be seemingly the greatest man with the greatest mind, using the greatest military genius to persuade the world to worship his greatest ego. He will be revealed after the rapture, he will make a covenant with Israel, which he will then break. Uh, by the way, that's just like the devil to make big promises uh, and break them. That's good to know God who cannot, will not break a promise. But this Antichrist will go on to kill the two witnesses of Revelation and persecute Israel until the Lord returns and destroys his army and casts him into the lake of fire, his coming. But then the... Uh, the conquest, this little horn will pluck up three other horns by the roots. So he will just, he will have his way with the horns and get rid of three that refuse to do his bidding. And then his character. Uh, this horn has eyes. How, how frightening is that to have a beast with a horn? And then you think, what a dreadful beast. And oh, look, ten horns. And oh, there's another little horn coming. Oh, that horn plucked up three other horns. And it has eyes. How strange, how dreadful. <laughs> um, it seemingly had human characteristics. Eyes probably depicted brilliance. And a mouth, uh, a big mouth, boastful, reminiscent of Lucifer and his I will statements of Isaiah chapter 14. We are always reminded that the eyes of the Lord are better. Uh, Zechariah 4.10 and other places, I think Proverbs 15 talks about the eyes of the Lord in every place, but Zechariah 4.10 tells us about the eyes of the Lord running to and fro throughout the whole earth. Uh, yeah, the devil's got eyes, and his, the Antichrist has eyes. He sees some things, but there's only one set of eyes that sees everything. Uh, praise the Lord, we have our God who's much more powerful. But this Antichrist, will, he'll be a good actor, and he will be able to seemingly look like he is the pinnacle of power and genius and might. But his, uh, they used to say every dog has his day. And the Antichrist will have his day for a little while. And then he'll be overthrown. So we saw the subsequent empire he saw. And then verses 9 through 14 we see the supernatural empire he saw. Verses 9 through 14. All right, first of all, we see the throne in verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. That's very interesting. His wheels... God has wheels. Um, but again, it was uh, the throne. He saw, he saw thrones cast down, and then he saw the Ancient of Days sitting. Well, where's the Ancient of Days going to sit? On the true throne. 
and then he sees wheels. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. All right, uh, so first of all, we see the subordinate seats of power and then the supreme seats of power. The subordinate seats of power, uh, uh, in, in the beginning there, were, were, were overthrown. Uh, the Aramaic participle can mean to put or impose. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, cross-reference uh, Ezra 7.24. This can be referring to thrones put down or a throne imposed over other thrones. Uh, but next we see the supreme seats of power. Uh, we see God in his future courtroom. The Antichrist will be judged immediately prior to the millennium. Uh, interesting note, the Ancient of Days comes from the same root antique comes from, uh, with the uh, Aramaic tendency to nasalization, we can identify that root. This term reminds us of the eternality of the Father. Um, let me, let me go ahead and cross-reference Isaiah 57, 15. I don't have time to read all of these cross-references, but that's, a, of course, a, a fun passage. Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the High and Lofty One that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. This high and holy one, uh, he will be the ultimate judge, verses 13 and 14. Paul teaches that Christ will actually deliver his kingdom to the Father, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. The white appearance denotes the purity, maturity, and truth of God, Isaiah 1, 18, Revelation 3, 5, 4, 4, 19, 8, and 11. In Revelation 1, uh, 12 and 13, John tells of God having a white uh, head and white hair and eyes like a flame of fire. Also, it's interesting to note that in speaking of the throne, he mentions wheels as burning fire. Uh, so again, that's curious. Why are there wheels on this throne? But it seems that like God has a very special throne. Uh, Ezekiel 1, verses 13 through 15, appears that God has some sort of chariot throne, possibly carried about uh, by, by even angels, possibly within those wheels. Uh, I, I, I look forward to seeing it someday, because uh, our magnificent God, I'm sure, has a magnificent throne. And uh, we don't even know how to properly use that word magnificent. We'll know someday. In the beginning of verse 10, it mentions a fiery stream issuing forth, uh, Pial active participle. We recall from Hebrews 12, 29 that our God is a consuming fire. So we saw the throne. Now we see the throng in verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. The throng, 10,000 times 10,000. Mathematicians of old did not have a name for anything higher than the square of 10,000. Several passages teach that the number of angels appears innumerable. Deuteronomy 33.2, Job 25.3, and Hebrews 12.22. So this throng, we see first of all where they stood, and then what they saw. Well, where did they stand? Uh, these many thousands stood before his presence. What did they see? As they ministered to him, uh, they saw the books were open. The books apparently contained the deeds of the four beasts and the little horn. God records the deeds of men and will judge them. Revelation 20, verse 12. God writes, Exodus 32, 32, to go to heaven, your name must be found written in God's book. God has books. Revelation 3, 5, Daniel's, uh, Daniel 12, 1. Uh, we even remember Luke 10, 20 that says, Rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. So the throne, and then the throng, and then the thrill. Verses 11 through 14. The evil one is put away, and the Son of Man 
is exalted. Two things underneath the thrill, the vanquished one and the victorious one. So let's read verses 11 and 12, the vanquished one. I beheld then because the voice of the great words which the horn spake, um, uh, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. The vanquished one. Uh, the little horn spoke great words against the Most High, but is it any surprise that God has the last word in judgment of the Antichrist's beast? 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. Who... Uh, the son of perdition opposeth and exalteth himself. So underneath the vanquished one, we see two things, the destruction of the fourth beast and the destruction of the former beasts. The destruction of the fourth beast, the word destroyed is used. At the end of the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 13, 1 through 4, and Revelation 19, 19 through 20, uh, uh, there's, there's some passages there, but but let me just read a few words here. I saw the beast cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. We can cross-reference Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. So the destruction of the fourth beast and the destruction of the former beasts, verse 12. Dominion was taken away from them. They continued in some form into their successor's kingdom. Daniel kind of illustrates this where Daniel didn't disappear with the Babylonian Empire, he continued on into the next one to some degree. So, it's, so too, it seems like uh, each of these kingdoms, uh, uh, its influence carries on to the next, as influence is absorbed by the next. However, this, when, when Christ's kingdom comes, there's no influence carried into it. Uh, there's no um, uh, influence being absorbed by the Lord's kingdom. The old is terminated, and the new has begun. Fully terminated. So we saw the vanquished one, verses 11 and 12. Then in verses 13 and 14, we see the victorious one. Uh, verses 13 and 14. I saw in the, vision, in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. The Antichrist just spoke of destruction for him, but here is a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. One like the Son of Man came with clouds of heaven. Uh, we think of Matthew twenty four thirty. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, in clouds of heaven. So two things underneath this victorious one. We see the presentation and the proclamation. The presentation, he was brought near to the Ancient of Days, the Father. Notice their distinction. Who is this? Uh, well, Jesus told us who this is, brought before the Ancient of Days, in Mark 14, 61 and 62. Again, the high priest asked him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The presentation. Then we see the proclamation in verse 14. He has all authority. All are to serve him. Notice, too, that this son was given the everlasting kingdom. This is the coronation of Christ as king. Uh, we think of Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9. The Lord Jesus will have dominion over all people, nations, and languages for his millennial reign. Revelation 20, verses 4 through 6. See how much scripture this ties together? And again, I don't have time to go through all those passages, but maybe you can go ahead and pause this video and read those. That would be worth your time. If you have it, it would be well worth your time. After this, the Lord will continue to reign throughout eternity in the new heavens and earth. 2 Peter 3, 10-13. So, um, we saw the uh, 
information in the, well, the first point we saw was the, uh, uh, the introduction to the vision and then information in the vision. And now we see the interpretation of the vision in verses 15 through 28. So in uh, verses 15 through 16, we see Daniel's puzzled request. Verses 15 and 16. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. So his puzzled request. We see his distress and we see his desire. In verse 15, his distress. His spirit was grieved, literally contracted uh, in spirit and body. Literally body like a sheath. And his head was troubled. It is as though Daniel is telling us that he was mentally and emotionally shriveled up inside his physical body. Next, we see his desire. He asked one of the standers there, presumably an angel, quite possibly Gabriel, uh, cross-reference 8, 16, and 9, 21. Uh, Would you please interpret the truth of this dream? What an amazing turn of events. Daniel was the dream interpreter. He's the, when you got a dream and you need some help, call up this man. You know, maybe he had uh, an ad different places. You need your dream interpreted? But here, instead, he has a dream. And he says, please, I need some help figuring out what this means. Um, when we think of uh, 2.28 and 4.19 and 5.17. Uh, and so the interpretation was revealed to him. So Daniel's puzzled request. Then Daniel's prophetic review. Uh, chapter 7, verses 17 through 27. So, a uh, lengthy passage here. So, first of all, we see under Daniel's prophetic review, the five kingdoms, verses 17 and 18. Uh, so, with this, I'll, I'll point out a couple things. The four passing kingdoms and the fifth permanent kingdom. So, in verse 17, we see four passing kingdoms. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. So four kings. These were, of course, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. The sea from earlier represented the earth, and the little horn pictured a terrible future leader emerging from the revived Roman Empire. And then in verse 18, we see a fifth permanent kingdom. But the saints of the Most High... Um, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. (laughs) So it sounds like a long time when you say forever, even forever and ever. Um, This one taken by the saints of the Most High is forever and ever, literally unto forever and unto forever and forever. (laughs) These saints are believers. Zechariah 14, 16, Revelation 1, 6, 5, 10, 19, 13 through 15, and 20, verse 6. Even though Daniel had used uh, this term uh, to presumably describe an angel in 4, 13 and 23, he talked about uh, a a watcher uh, who came down even an holy one. Uh, The idea there of an holy one is a set apart one, uh, a saint. And so the term back then was most likely referring to an angel, a set-apart being. Um, Saints here, there's another form of set-apart being that are believers that are saved and set apart unto the one who saved them. Um, So uh, here are believers that will take this kingdom. Uh, The most high in the verse, also this is interesting, is a plural Aramaic noun. You say, wait, wait, God? Most High is referring to God. Why is it plural? Well, hopefully it's sinking in right now. Another portrayal in Syriac of the truth of our triune God. So we saw the five kingdoms. Next, we see the fourth kingdom. 
So we looked at one, two, three, four, and then we looked at the fifth kingdom, but we're coming back to that fourth kingdom for a minute. The fourth kingdom, verses 19 through 26. So that Roman Empire, and then the revived Roman Empire, and what comes out of that revived Roman Empire, that's what we're talking about right now. Uh, Rome uh, from the past, and then Rome on into the future, the revived Roman Empire that will be there in the time of tribulation. So the fourth kingdom. Uh, first of all, we see symbolism reviewed. Symbolism reviewed. And for this, I'll read verses uh, uh, 19 through 22. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. And again, he is, uh, uh, we heard some of these details earlier. And his nails of brass, metal claws. That is scary. An animal coming to you that's really scary with iron teeth and uh, nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet. And of the ten horns uh, that were in his head, and of the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints, and prevailed against them, until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So symbolism reviewed uh, three things. The conquest of the empire. Back to this dreadful fourth kingdom. This beast was diverse and exceeding dreadful. It had teeth of iron and nails of brass, metal claws depicting the ferocious bloodshed of this kingdom. It would devour, break in pieces, and stamp the remaining uh, just a, a thoroughness in its destruction, cross-reference of verse 7. So the conquest of this empire. Then the character of this empire. The horn with eyes, uh, again, these eyes possibly denoting supernatural intelligence, and a big mouth, and a more stout, uh, literally intimidating look than his fellows, he uprooted three other horns. This sinister-looking horn is the Antichrist, who would blaspheme the Lord, 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 4 and following. And then we see the career of the empire. It existed to battle the saints of the Most High. During the last half of the uh, seven-year tribulation, he would persecute the saints until Christ will defeat him at Armageddon. Revelation 12, verses 13 through 17 and 19, 11 through 21. So symbolism reviewed. And then significance revealed, verses 23 through 26. Um, uh, first of all, underneath this, we see the fourth empire. Uh, and then we see the final emperor. And we'll give you, give you some points under the final emperor. But the... Uh, But the, uh, the fourth empire, verses 23 through 24. Thus he said, uh, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down, and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So let's talk about the Roman Empire for a, a moment. Um, so the, the fourth empire, the fourth beast is the fourth empire, Rome, which will devour the whole earth. This kingdom is different, uh, possibly uh, more blasphemous than others, uh, among other different things, um, and, and more different and widespread in nature. With intensity, it would, it would, uh, um, it would tear down it would tear down and break in pieces uh, those that opposed it. The Ten Horns were a ten-king federation which would arise from the old Roman Empire. These would rule until Christ returns. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read ver uh, 
a few verses out of Revelation 17. Revelation 17, 12 through 14. Revelation 17, 12 through 14. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, um, where the, well, and then so on, and going on. But we see the, uh, um, the fourth empire. Then out of this fourth empire comes the final emperor of this fourth empire. Uh, verses 24 through 26. Let me read those. So at the end of 24, we saw that another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. Uh, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. So the final emperor, one shall arise, a little horn from the ten kingdom confederacy, who is diverse from them. So let me give you five things about this final emperor. One, his power. Uh, he subdues three of the kings. Uh, secondly, his provocation. Uh, he provokes God by speaking great words against him. He is the epitome of blasphemy. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 and following. Now, the preposition against means at the side of and seems to indicate that he will attempt to parallel Christ in position and proclamations. Uh, you can cross reference 11.36 and following. Boy, these great words remind us again of the devil thinking that he was like God. Thirdly, his persecution. Uh, he is going to wear out the saints. Wear out uh, is just like when you have garments that are worn out um, from, from, from overuse uh, or just time. Um, uh, Deuteronomy 8.4 kind of gives that idea. And then, and then Joshua 9.4 uh, tells us about the Gibeonites that, that dressed up like they were from a far country. And they took worn garments to deceive Joshua into, into making him think that uh, they were from a far away. But he'll take the saints and wear them out. Uh, they'll be threadbare uh, through and through. Uh, and then fourthly, his program. Uh, he plans to change times and laws. Uh, it's interesting, in the midst of France's godless revolution, they attempted to institute a 10-day week. And of course, it's interesting to know that it didn't work for them. Uh, the bodies of even the animals couldn't cope with that schedule. It's almost like God designed human beings to, to, to cycle through seven-day weeks. Um, so maybe he will attempt to do something like that and change the number of days in a week. Maybe create a sexagismal week or a six-day week. Undoubtedly, his laws would work to eradicate the worship of Jehovah. Uh, Daniel encountered that a couple times uh, when it became illegal to worship God, his friends had to bow uh, before a false god, and then Daniel was told he couldn't pray to his own god. See, the, the world uh, and the powers that be and the, and the devil himself, they make various attempts to see if uh, they can wipe out the worship of God. And those that are faithful, sometimes uh, God delivers them out of great danger, and sometimes God delivers them through the great danger, uh, through death, into his own restful, powerful hand in eternity. Uh, they, here refers to tribulation saints. They will be given into his hand uh, for a time the, the Antichrist will have power uh, to do them hurt. Um, for a time, the Bible says, times and half a time. So time, times and half a time, time 
Here, uh, from comparing scripture with scripture, we see time is one year. Times are two years, and then half a time, well, half of one of those years, we have three and a half years. Um, in Revelation 13, 5 through 7, we see John speaking about this same time as 42 months. And as we know, 42 months, 12 months in one year, 24 months in two years, six months and a half a year, uh, that adds up to 42 months, three and a half years. But the last thing we see about this final emperor is his punishment, verse 20, uh, 26. His dominion shall be taken from him, he will lose his kingdom, and will be cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 19, 20. All right, then in verse 27, we see the fifth kingdom once again. I'm glad that there's always this fifth kingdom that shows that God has the last word. In verse 27, it says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. The fifth kingdom, the Lord's millennial kingdom, will be set up after the demise of Antichrist and his revived Roman Empire. We see two things, the ministers of this fifth kingdom and the monarch of this fifth kingdom. The ministers, well, this kingdom will be given over to the people of the saints of the Most High. These are believers, both Jews and Gentiles, who survived the tribulation. You ask, wait a minute, is it possible for a believer to survive the tribulation? Yes, and here they are. Uh, they will be given the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5, 3 through 8, to serve and obey the Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Timothy 2, 12. And they will have an interesting opportunity to live in their natural bodies on the earth for the entire thousand-year reign of Christ. Um, this will be even longer than our beloved ancient guy, from the Old Testament, Methuselah, who lived 969 years, Genesis 5, 27. During this time, they will bear children who will need to be saved. Some uh, passages, it was interesting uh, looking up today and studying some, but Isaiah 65, uh, 20, and Zechariah 14, 16 through 21. It's ministers and it's monarch. It's monarch. Uh, the Most High will rule over all. All right, so it brings us to the last verse of this chapter. And uh, uh, we had just seen Daniel's prophetic review, and uh, now we get to the end, and we see Daniel's personal reaction in verse 28. And we kind of uh, talked about it earlier. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cognitions much troubled me and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Um, Daniel was troubled by all of this, but kept it in his heart. Cognitions are thoughts. He was very much troubled, so much so that his countenance changed. Possibly the color even drained away from him. We saw that happen to Belshazzar earlier uh, in, five, six, uh, in chapter 5, verses 6, 9, and 10. But he kept all of this in his heart until he wrote it down here in chapter 7. So I guess I leave it to you some degree. It's not the same as the adventures of, of Daniel chapters 1 through 6. But at the same time, it's very exciting to know that everything is working according to the plan of someone who loves me. And uh, he has the last word. As long as I'm following him and uh, living every day according to his program. I think that's part of why we pray, Oh God, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And the Lord Jesus told us to pray that prayer routinely. Um, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. Our eyes are supposed to be set on these things. Our, what did somebody say? Our, our sword sharp, our knee bent, and our eye on the sky. Part of keeping our sword sharp will be studying passages like this. Part of keeping our eye on the sky will be to look for this kingdom and be praying for its coming. 
and part of our knee being bent will be just to walk with the one who holds it all in the palm of his hand every single day.